All right, so here we are in chapter 48. Now, we've, we've had a little bit of a hiatus from, the, from our, our Bible study. We, we are jumping back into this. We're all, we've only got a few weeks left. Chapter 48 is tonight, and then chapter 49 and 50 in the next two weeks. And we'll be finished with the entire book of Genesis. So we're kind of wrapping all the stories coming to a close. And what we see here, the, just a basic overview, of course, of chapter 48, is that Jacob is sick. And Joseph finds out about it, and basically Joseph goes to see his father before he dies, and his father gives a blessing to Ephraim and Manasseh. And that's, that's the entire content of what we're seeing here as a, as a broad overview. And um, in the next chapter, we're going to see all of the, the children of Israel getting blessed individually. Of course, these are just the sons of Joseph that are getting blessed in this chapter. But it's come time for him to, to pass on. He's gotten old. He's sick. Um, it's, it, there's, there's some similarity here, and I want you just to, to kind of keep in the back of your mind what it was like when Isaac was ready to die, and Jacob and Esau came for their blessing, right? And we remember that, uh, or at least, see, with him, it wasn't, he wasn't ready to die just yet, but they thought, he thought it was time to die, and, and that's when his sons came for the blessing. And um, it turned out that he ended up living much longer anyways. That's not the case here with Jacob. Jacob's an old man, and he is ready to die. He is, he is practically on his deathbed here. So um, they're coming in, and they receive this blessing. But let's start reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. So they, you know, Israel's sick. He's laying in his bed. You know, he's dying. And they tell him, hey, Joseph's here to see you. So he strengthens himself. You know, he sits up like a man. He, he wants to be able to present himself to, to Joseph and his sons. And he comes in. And um, verse number three, And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. So now he's going to go through a real brief history of his life. You know, this, this, this brief overview of how God appeared unto him and led him throughout the way. Let's, just, let's read through the, the highlights that he brings up as he looks back on his life, as he's about to bless his grandchildren. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And said unto me, Behold... I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee and I will make of thee a multitude of people and will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. Now, we see here Jacob, he remembers exactly what God told him. And if you remember on Sunday night, we preached on, on Hebrews chapter 11. That's the great faith chapter. And we can see the evidence in their life that they had this faith and the things that they did, they were doing in obedience to God. And they were doing because they had faith that the promises that God had made unto them, He was going to keep them. And we see now at the end of His life, He's gone through His whole life. At the very end of His life, He's still referring, hey, God made this promise unto me. And he firmly believes it to be true. And the reason why he's even going into this now is because he's going to pass this blessing that God has blessed him with, this promise that God has blessed unto him and to his progenitors, unto Ephraim and Manasseh. Because he even says, you know, the promise started with Abraham. This same promise of, of being fruitful and multiplying his seed and coming into the, the promised land and all of this, all of that good news, it, it started with Abraham. And then that passed on, the same promise passed on to Isaac. And then that same promise passed on to Jacob, which is Israel. And now, of course, Israel has 12 sons. So Israel is, is, is deciding that, well, this blessing from God is going to pass on to eat the sons of Joseph. You remember, Joseph was his favorite son. Joseph was the one that he loved. He made the coat of many colors, you know, prior to him being sold into Egypt and everything else that happened to him. He was the favorite. And then, of course, when he came back, um, I I'm sure that didn't change with his father, with him taking care of everybody and the position that he was in and everything else. So, now he decides he's going to pass this blessing on to his grandchildren, the sons of Joseph. And it says in verse number 5, And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt, 
Before I came unto thee into Egypt are mine as Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. So what he's saying here is that, you know, as far as the inheritance goes and everything else, Manasseh and Ephraim now are going to be considered to be as if they were born from Israel, as if they were, they were physically his, his direct descendants and not his grandchildren. So because uh, at the end of his life, you know, the, the, the father... When he dies, his inheritance goes unto his children. And we're going to see the blessings and stuff in the next chapter that he gives unto his children, unto you know, Judah and Simeon and Reuben and Levi and you know, and just everybody that, that are his sons. They get the inheritance. But what he's doing here is he's saying, well, Manasseh and Ephraim, they're like my children. So that's why when he blesses them here, this is like they're going to be receiving an inheritance. And at the end of the chapter, we can just look at that real quick um, in verse 22. I'll just cover this right now. It says, Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. So he's saying, you know, when he's regard, in regards to the inheritance, because Joseph would get his normal portion, which would pass unto his sons, but because now there's two, there's Manasseh and Ephraim, that, that were from Joseph, well, he's saying, well, there's this extra part that you're getting. So in the inheritance from Nassim and Ephraim, you're, you're going to get this extra part that I've taken, you know, in, in battle and, and you know, I've taken over this land from the Amorite. So that is going to be given, in addition to everything else that we have right here, that is the extra portion that's going to him. So verse 6, he goes on to explain that, that he is now taking Manasseh and Ephraim as if they were his children. And he says, And thy issue which thou begettest after them shall be thine. So any further children that Joseph has, he says, Yep, those children now are going to be just considered like your children. They're going to receive inheritance down your line, separate from the, uh, what he, how he's considering Ephraim and Manasseh. He says, um, And shall be called after the name of their brethren and their inheritance. So he's, he said they're going to follow that line with Ephraim and Manasseh because it would be called after their brethren. Verse number 7, And as for me, when I came from Paden, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way, when yet there was but a little way to come unto Ephrath, and I buried her there in the way of Ephrath, the same as Bethlehem. Of course, Rachel was um, um, Joseph's mother. right? And he's just, he's just going over how, how Rachel died, which... He already knew that because when he was sold into slavery, he was like 17 years old and Rachel had already been dead. It was, it was, it was at this point. But he's just kind of going through this, this overview of his life. Verse number 8, And Israel said, or beheld Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? Now, we know that, that Israel already knows Ephraim and Manasseh because he's already mentioned them. And he's already mentioned them as being his children now. But... What happens here is that Israel, he's so old that is, he's basically blind because he's so old. You know, people end up losing their eyesight as you get older and older. And now the Bible says that, that his eyes, in verse 10, now the eyes of Israel were dim for age so that he could not see. So he knew that there was people there. He knew that these kids were there. So he asked, like, well, who, you know, who's here with you? Who are these? Verse 9, And Joseph said unto his father, They are my sons whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me and I will bless them. Now, when I was reading this chapter and studying for this chapter, because honestly, there's not a lot of content of like surface meaning going on in this chapter. I mean, basically, Joseph comes with his children, he blesses them, and that's the whole chapter. But what stood out to me as I was studying this and reading it and over and over again, what stood out to me is, is just, the, just a real simple phrase. He says, you know, when Joseph answered who these children were, he says, these are my sons whom God hath given me in this place. He gives the credit unto God right away. We have a tendency, and we were talking about this slightly before service on a completely different subject, we have a tendency to be so used to things that are like commonplace where we ought to be giving God a lot more credit and we ought to be a lot more mindful for the, for the luxuries maybe that we have, and in this case, especially for our children. And I know oftentimes children can be a burden. They can be a hard work. They, they, it, it takes a lot of effort to raise children and to raise them right. And I know in our house, they run around and they make messes and, and my wife's trying to clean up one part of the house and they're like behind her back, clean, you know, making a mess out of another part of the house. And it can be frustrating. It can be difficult. 
It is hard. It's not an easy job at all. You got to teach them. You got to train them. You got to spend time with them. And there's always these other things that you need to do and get done. But the children are so important. And what we need to recognize is that, hey, God has given these to you. And even the times when it may not feel like it, they truly are a blessing. Now, this chapter is talking about being blessed and the blessings that, that Israel is going to pass on unto Joseph and his sons. And the blessing he's going to make. Hey, one of the best blessings that we have and, and, and what Joseph, even just, just, just in his answer, he's giving this, this credit unto God. He said, God has given me these children in this place as part of his normal speech. He's not like trying to make a speech or trying to impress anybody by his godly speak. This is who Joseph was. And this is who we ought to be. This is the, 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 the mentality that we ought to have with our children. Say, look, hey, these are my children that God has given unto me. It's a big deal. The Bible says in Psalm 127, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. It's a good thing to have children. We live in a backward society today that thinks that having children is a burden and that it is a pain and that you need to just, just stop at one or stop at two children and that's enough because they cost you so much money and there's so much work and that's all we ever need to do and we don't want to have any more. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. And if you have that type of an attitude, you know, I question how much are you even going to love your child? Now, I know it's, when you, once you have your children, you know, people make these big plans in their mind, but once you have your child, like, the plans go out the window. And in many cases, they ought to go out the window. You're saying, well, I'm just planning on having one child and I'm done. Hopefully, people you know, that say that early on are just ignorant. They, they, once they have their child, they realize how much they love them and how much of a blessing they truly are. And they treat them as such, and they don't just treat them as a big burden. Because the Bible says, low children are in heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. That's a reward. Hey, so God's saying, hey, good job. I love you. Here's a reward for you. Here's a gift of a child. Verse 4 of Psalm 127, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. You don't have to wait until you get really old to have children. You have to wait until you get married. Don't go committing fornication because you think you want to get this, this blessing from God of the fruit of the womb. Do it the right way. Get married. But there's no problem with doing it in your youth. You know, people were saying, you know, they're 19, 20 years old. Oh, man. It's, it's amazing how just like my parents' generation, there were lots of people getting married at 18, 17, 18, 19 years old, 20 years old, and starting families and you know, getting married at that, what we might consider a young age. But then the same people are told, oh no, you should wait, you know, go to college, go on vacation, do all this other stuff for you, and then have children. And that is poor advice. That is poor advice, my friend. <laughs> there are so many reasons to start a family young. And, you know, I'm not upset with my life at all. I, I love my wife and I love our family. And, you know, I don't dwell on things like this, but I just, you know, every once in a while I think, you know, what if we would have gotten married way younger and had more time to have even more kids and a bigger family? And, you know, when you're younger, you're a lot stronger to do the things. You know, if you wait too long, sometimes you start thinking, well, wait, and I know it goes through my mind, you know, I've got a newborn, I'm 38 now. In 10 years, I'm going to be 48. How well am I going to be able to keep up with them and run around and play and do the things that, that, that dads ought to be doing with their children? Don't put off having a family, especially if you want to have it. Don't put it off for too long. And, and you know what? I'm not complaining. I love it. I am going to do my best to be the best dad in the world to my children. I love my wife, and, and I wouldn't trade her for anyone else in the world. And the way things worked out for us is the way they worked out. But I was also wasn't planning on, on putting off marriage and everything else because I was following bad advice of doing all this other stuff first. So my circumstances are the same, and, and, and that's my point. You know, sometimes people don't get married until they're later or have children until later. Okay, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But the Bible does say, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Like from the youth, of the youth. 
It's a good thing to, to, to do that. Don't let people dissuade you from having a family early on just because you might seem kind of young. The Bible says in verse 5, Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Children are a blessing. What happened to people even giving honor and respect unto the Lord by recognizing that He's the giver of life? It's just, it's just taken for granted these days. And I think part of the problem is just that people don't even view children as a blessing, as they, as they truly are. Joseph recognized it here, but he's the one that said, God's, God gave me these children in this land. And it's part of his normal speech, his normal every day, the way that, the way that he talks about his children. Hey, God gave me these children. Who are these children? They're the ones that God gave me and when I was in this land, before you even came down here. And he said, bring them, I pray thee unto me. We're back in Genesis 48. And I will bless them. Verse 10, now the eyes of Israel were dim for age so that he could not see and he brought them near unto him and he kissed them and embraced them. And again, this kind of stood out to me also reading this chapter. You see what happens, you know, he's an old man and, and his eyes are, he's blind and the kid's unto him and what does he do? He gives them a big kiss and a hug. He loves his grandchildren. And they were, they, were, they were still pretty young because it said that Joseph brought them out from, from behind his knees, like from his knees, so they were, they were still younger children. You know, they weren't, they weren't fully grown or anything, but, but he, they, go to, they go to Israel and he gives them a big hug and a kiss and he's there to bless them. And what this shows me is that, you know, this is a strong family where they, they put a big importance on the blessing upon the children and just the... the, the the well-being of the children and thinking about the children and, and them growing up and being blessed and being multiplied and the hard work that goes and is involved in that for, for, the, for the man to provide for his whole family and being focused on the well-being of the children. We live in a selfish society where people aren't very, you know, focused on the right priorities. People have children, you know, they'll, they'll work and they'll work real hard, but the, the, they'll want to go on vacation and leave their children behind and they will go, want to go and do all these other things and they're not as worried about their children, not worried about their upbringing and their teaching. And they're, they're willing to, to drop them off with somebody else for eight hours because they don't want to teach them themselves. They're willing to just, to just you know, outsource the care and the teaching and, and everything else that is important in their life that, that ought to be coming from their parents. The ones who truly love them. Now look, the, the hireling, when you hire someone else to take care of your child, they are never going to love them the way that you do. Even if you get a great person who really does care and love kids, they will never love them the way that you do, ever. And most of them are not that great and caring and loving in general anyways, to where they really care that much about your child. And maybe there's some kids that they care and love, but they're not going to care and love all of them. I mean, let's face it, there's times that your kids do things that only their parent is going to still be loving them through the things that they do. But that's why it's so important for the parents to be the ones being the, the primary source for their nurturing, for their care, and for their teaching. That's why we're homeschooling our children, because it's important, because we, I do not want to trust their whole, I mean, their education is going to impact their future. What they're taught when they're young is going to have a big impact on what they do later on in their life. A big impact. Don't ever overlook that or underestimate that the, 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 the power that you have and the molding and the sculpting of your child. Do you really want to just put that into somebody else's hands that you don't even know and just let them do, mold your child in their view? And then when they grow up, you'll be like, well, that's not how I raised my child. Yeah, that's how someone else raised your child. The things that children learn from an early age stays with them. Moses was not with his parents very long, but they raised him in a proper way from, from that young age. And when he was old, he didn't depart from that way. He went back to those ways.
flip back real quick to Genesis 18. We covered this back when we, did, when we went through the, the chapter in Genesis 18, but I want to point this out because the Bible emphasizes a strong family. And that's what we see here. We see grandfather Israel, son uh, Joseph, and grandchildren Manasseh and Ephraim all there together in one place for the children to be blessed by grandpa. He's blessing the children. Genesis 18, verse 19, referring to Abraham. This is God speaking about Abraham. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. God says, I know Abraham. I know he's a good man. I know that he is going to take the time to sit his children down and to teach them the right way and teach them the way of the Lord. That's what we're missing today. Look, it takes time. Guess what? You may have to turn off your favorite TV show to sit down with your children and teach them what they need to learn. You may need to give up some hobby. You may need to get off the stinking internet and get off Facebook and spend some time with your children in order to teach them what's important. But it needs to be done. Are you the type of person that God could look down on and say, I know, I know you, I know this person, and I know that they will teach their children. They will teach them to fear God. They will teach them everything that they need to know. He knew that about Abraham. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, go ahead and turn there if you would. Deuteronomy chapter number 6, we see more stress and importance of teaching the Bible to your children. And, and, and I firmly believe this too. You know, we homeschool children, the, the, the primary, the most important thing that we can teach our children is God's Word, is the Bible. God's Word is truth. I mean, you want your, your child to be smart? You want your child to have wisdom? You want them to know the truth about things? Teach them God's Word. That's the primary thing. Now, does that mean we're not going to teach our children anything else? No. We're going to teach them all the, all, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, you know, all, the, all the important basics and, and other things and history and, and other things. But you know what's never going to be missed and never going to be skipped? It's the Bible teaching. The source of all truth and what's right. Look what the Bible says in Deuteronomy 6, verse number 6. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. He's talking about the law. I mean, Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law here. So he's saying, these words that I tell you, which I command you this day, shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. It's a command of God. Thou shalt teach them diligently with much carefulness, making sure that you are taking the time and investing the time appropriately, that you are diligent about it. You're not just slack about it. You're not letting it go by the wayside. You make it a priority. You teach the commands of God diligently unto thy children and shall talk of them. Look at this. When thou sittest in thine house. So when's a good time to teach your child? When you're sitting in your house. And... When thou walkest by the way, when you're out in the car, when you're out driving somewhere, when you're on a trip, hey, that's a good time to teach your children. How about this? And when thou liest down, when you're getting ready for bed, and when thou risest up. Sounds like there's a lot of good times to teach your children. It sounds like it's something that ought to be on your mind all the time. And that you ought to be able to continually be giving wisdom to your children and teaching them, hey, when you get up, hey, when you go down to bed, hey, when you go out to the store, hey, when you're just sitting in the house. It's that important. It is that important. The, the, the strength of your family is important. How is a family going to stay strong? Well, first, the parents need to stay together. Everybody needs to stay together. That's the only way you're going to get that strength. The husband and wife need to be loving each other and have a proper relationship, a biblical, godly relationship, where the husband is the head of the household and the wife is the keeper of the house. That's the way God has ordained it. That's the way God has outlined it. That's what we're made to do. That's how we're created as people. God put these desires into us. Let's use them to the best of our ability and fall into the mold that He has created for us. 
And as the, 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 the parents, they stay together, it doesn't stop there to have a strong family. That is primary. That needs to happen. If you, you split up, you can't have a strong family. The family means everybody's together. But once you have the, the, the husband and the wife, they're dedicated to each other, they love each other, you need to teach the children. And I believe husband and wife. Now, the wife, it's going to be more of her job to be able to do that because the, the husband is, is, needs, is in the need to provide for the family, to make sure that there's food, to make sure that there's clothes, to make sure that these things are available. So he's not at, at around the children as often as, as the wife is. But both need to be teaching. I'll tell you this, I teach, I teach my, ch my children the Bible. I read to them every single night before they go to bed. We read the Bible every night. And I try to expound on it a little bit too. Um, and just teach them from time to time. We'll have discussions because they're real young right now. We'll talk about salvation in the car. And this is important. It's important that they know these things. They know the truth from God's word. And my wife will take them and, and teach them Proverbs and teach them other things. And, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll tell them stories that they really like. They'll ask us for, to, to teach them on, uh, you know, David and Goliath and on Jonah and all these other stories that are, that are real exciting to them out of the Bible. But regardless, I don't want to go off on a tangent on all the things that we do. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you are being diligent about teaching your kids. Hey, teach them right and wrong. Teach them the commands of God. Teach them that this is acceptable and this is not acceptable. Even though you may see people in our family doing this, even though you may see people out on the street doing this, it's still wrong. God says that it's wrong and we need to, to be wise and listen to what God says. But the parents need to be diligently teaching their children that and don't just pawn it off. On and hey, don't just think that bringing them to church is enough for them to learn. As a ch the parents, you need to be the one taking responsibility for your own children. Don't rely on someone else to do all the teaching for them. You do the teaching. Nothing wrong with bringing them to church again, but that should be extra learning. And just like in your own life, church should just be additional content to your own daily Bible reading and studying anyways. Besides these two verses, I would like to flip back, if you would, to Genesis 48. We looked at Genesis 18. We saw the, the, the example of Abraham being a good, godly man that's teaching his children and teaching his household the right way and commanding them to, to obey God. We saw in Deuteronomy chapter 6 the admonition to, to diligently teach your children the law. We have the entire book of Proverbs. When you start going through chapters 2, 3, 4, we see, My son... Listen, right? The Proverbs of Solomon. My son, listen. Give, ear to my, give, give me your ear. Right? Bow down thine ear to wisdom and to instruction. That's instruction. It's wisdom given in, in many cases there in the Proverbs of Solomon unto his son. He's saying, son, listen to me. You know, don't forget the laws of your mother and your father. You know, keep this up. It's, it's the wisdom that needs to be taught and it's stressed specifically in those chapters unto his son, unto his children. Teaching your children is extremely important and keeping a strong family is also important. Let's keep reading here in Genesis 48. I'm in Leviticus. Genesis 48. So I think we left off in verse 10. He said he kissed him and he hugged him. Verse 11, And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God hath showed me also thy seed. So it was a great event for, for Israel, just saying, you know, I thought you were dead. I never thought I was going to see your face again, and not only am I able to see you now, but I'm also able to see your children. What a great blessing. Verse 12, And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. So Joseph bows himself down as he brings his children forward. And he gives reverence unto his father. He gives respect unto his old man. Verse 13, And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. So here we see, Joseph knows it's time for their blessing. So he takes Ephraim, which was the second born, in his right hand. 
and Manasseh, which was the firstborn in his left hand. So if he's facing his father the way that you're facing me right now, right? he's got his firstborn on his left hand to guide him towards um, Israel's right hand, and the secondborn, Ephraim, in his right hand to guide him towards Israel's left hand. He's making it easy on his dad because what's always been historic in the Bible is that the, the firstborn always receives the extra blessing, the double portion. They're the ones that get that, that blessing. Well, let's keep reading here. Verse 14, And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. So Israel knows exactly what he's doing, and what he's doing is this. He basically crosses his arms. You know, Joseph's trying to, trying to put him in the right place for him to put his hands on, but Israel has a, has a different thought in mind. He has, he's got his blessing. He already knows what he's going to do, and he knows where the children are, and he puts his hands like this so that he can put his right hand on, because the right hand is the one where he's getting, you know, given the, 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 the bigger blessing from, and, and the left hand. And I don't want to get into the whole right hand, left hand thing in the Bible. It's really not that big of a deal, but... Um, Symbolically, the, the right hand is always the, the strength and, and the left hand is the off hand. But, I mean, he's still giving a blessing to both, but, but he's, he's putting Ephraim above Manasseh, even though he was the secondborn and not the firstborn. Verse 15, And he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day. And I love this too. The way that he starts off his blessing is the same way that Jesus gives uh, in the, you know, the Lord's Prayer as his template, as his example for how to pray. Extolling God and thanking God and giving praise unto God. And he says, the same God, the God that fed me all my life long unto this day. All the travels that he did, all the places he was in, traveling from place to place and being worried about meeting up with his brother and, and everything else that happened in his life that we've already covered through the book of Genesis. God fed him the whole way. Through good times, through bad times, he was fed. And now even through famine, right? God took care of him still. He used Joseph to do it, but he still kept them. He kept them well fed through the whole, the whole famine that went throughout all the land. It says, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. He's saying, the same God that fed me and the same God that redeemed me. I want his blessing on these children right here. And let, not, and let my name be named on them and the name of my fathers, I, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So he starts blessing them now. He's giving his blessing upon these children. And Joseph tries to stop him. It says that when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. So you know, Joseph sees what's going on. He said, wait, 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 wait. Don't bless him yet. You know, like you, you, you got your hand in the wrong place. You know, this is the firstborn. He's, try, he's, trying, to, he's trying to move his hand physically and, just, and move it so that Manasseh would get the, the, the better blessing. And his father refused, verse 19. Or he says in verse 18, And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh, and he set Ephraim before Manasseh. So, we see here that, that Israel knows what he's doing, right? Before it said he wittingly did it, and, and Joseph even tries to stop and say, no, 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 you know, he's the firstborn, put your right hand on him. He says, no, I know what I'm doing. And I think that part of this comes from Jacob himself. Remember, he was the younger and Esau was going to get the double portion, and he went and stole the blessing from him back when he was younger, and um, and and that whole fiasco that he had. First, he he you know he bought he purchased the birthright, and then later on though he stole the blessing. He pretended to be Esau 
to, and, and receive that blessing in the, in the wrong way to do it. But this idea of the blessing and the importance of the blessing, you know, Jacob knew that. And, and personally, what I think, you know, and if you don't agree with this, that's fine. But I think he, he did this and specifically chose the younger over the old one just because of his own experience. He knows what it's like to be the younger child and to not receive that double portion, not receive the better blessing. And he chose this time, you know, there's no, no shenanigans going on. He decided to just say, okay, well, I'm going to bless Ephraim above Manasseh. And that was his choice. And you know what? He was able to do that because he's the one giving the blessing. But what we can learn from this is the attitude that we need to have. You may look around yourself sometime and say, you know what, I deserve this blessing. Maybe it's on the job. Maybe it's something else in your life. Whatever. You can look and be, I'm the rightful person to be receiving this blessing. And you see someone else get it. Don't have a bad attitude about that. Look, if a blessing is something that's given to you, it's not something that's earned. So I'm not talking about like, like you've worked hard for something and didn't rightfully receive what was supposed to be coming to you. What I would say is this. Here's a good example. This, this happens sometimes at, at my work, the place I work. Every once in a while, one of the owners will, will stop in the office and sometimes he'll give like a couple hundred dollars to, to a person, right? And... He's doing that completely out of the goodness of his heart. He doesn't ever have to do that. He's not even doing it necessarily because they've earned it. You know, he likes to keep the morale, but every once in a while stop him and be like, hey, why don't you, why don't you go out to, so he's done this to me, say, why don't you take your wife out to eat? Here you go. Have, have a good, what are you doing this weekend? Well, take your wife out to eat. Go do something fun. And that's a blessing, right? That's great. But what we ought not to do is be like, looking at that other person who's getting this better blessing and then being envious over that person because they've been blessed. You know, God decides to bless people differently. Some people might be blessed financially or with a lot of children or with something else. Don't look on other people and just envy that blessing and end up despising the person who gets more of a blessing because... It's, it's wrong. It's wrong to do that because if someone's giving you a blessing, hey, that's, you should just be happy with the blessing that you get. And I tell my children that, you know, with Christmas coming up, it's important for them to realize this, that, you know, you don't earn your gifts. You might go into Christmas and not get any gift presents at all. You shouldn't be upset about that. Because you didn't do anything to earn the gifts. If people want to give you a gift, that's great. And if you only end up getting maybe one gift this Christmas, praise God for that. Be thankful for that. And don't be upset at people who don't buy you gifts. Don't be upset. At you can't come to expect blessings. It's something that's given. Don't come to just always expect gifts either. Don't come to expect anything in your life other than what God has promised you, which is food and clothing. He's promised us that. You can expect that. He will take care of us. But don't come to expect anything else. Because anything else that you receive is a blessing from God. And we ought to have the right heart and the right thankfulness. Now, we don't see here Ephraim and Manasseh being upset over this. I and mean, they're pretty young anyways. They probably don't really care that much. If I don't get it, they're just kind of going along with this. But Joseph sees it. You know, it, 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 he's thinking that Manasseh should be getting it because he's the firstborn. He's the rightful heir. Israel's doing the blessing. Let Israel do his blessing. And who he decides to, to raise up or to lift up above the other, that's, that's his prerogative. The same way God, whoever God decides to bless more than others, whether it be with finances or whether it be with other things, hey, praise the Lord for that person. You should be happy for that person. You know, when, when, in, in my situation with the boss, is when, when he gives like money, to, sometimes I, I, I appreciate it more. Like if I'm doing real well anyways and stuff, and, he's, and I see him and I happen to see, because he doesn't try to make a big show out of it either. Like he'll, he'll do it pretty, you know, quietly, but every once in a while you just, you know, you're, you're kind of in that place. And I see him giving to someone, to, to one of these guys that, that, that are really struggling. I think that's great. I praise God for that. I'm not sitting there thinking like, oh man, I wish you'd give me that money. 
You know, I mean, that's that's just a rotten attitude to have, and we shouldn't be expecting that type of a thing. So. This whole chapter and the next chapter is going to be even more into blessings. We see all these blessings coming. We ought to bless God and praise Him for the things that we do have in our life. And also, we need to make sure that we're keeping our family very important. Maybe you don't have kids in a family. Hey, but you're married. Keep that family strong from the beginning with your spouse, with your husband or with your wife. Stay together. Stay, you know, do things to make sure that... that, that you are forming that so you know for, for when you do have children that you are forming the, that bond where you will stay together and you will be strong together. Enjoy the time that you have without children. When you have children, enjoy the time that you have with the children. But make sure that you are you are treating your marriage and your family as being extremely important because the devil is going to go. The more you try to work, live for God, the more you try to live, your, work, uh, read the Bible, and do soul winning, and come to church, and do things that are right, and make a stand against the wickedness of the world. The more he's going to try to attack you. And one of the easiest ways to get people out of church is by attacking their family because it shakes people to the core. And when you see your family as being important, if you have to stop, no matter what you have to do, people will stop doing it to try to fix their family problems. And oftentimes it's the wrong decision to make because the last thing you need to be doing is getting out of church. Verse 21, we were at verse 22. It says, And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. And this is where he makes that promise unto him. And Joseph acts on this. We see this later. We, see, we read this in Hebrews 11, that Joseph made commandment concerning his bones because he had faith, because he knew that they were going to be taken out. That great faith that they had in the Lord. Hey, when God makes a promise, praise God, he keeps it every single time. He never fails. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this great chapter. Lord, I pray that you please strengthen our church family here together, dear Lord, that we would be looking out for one another and love each other and, and, and strengthen ourselves here and um, try to do things for each other. God, I pray that you please strengthen the individual families that are here, that, that you'd help us all to grow and, 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 and understand that children are a heritage of the Lord and that they truly are blessings and that we would treat them as such and put the, the proper importance on our children, dear Lord. And we just pray that you'd help us to have the right attitude in regards to blessings. And we thank you for what you've given us. We know that, they can, that everything that we have can be gone tomorrow. As it was in the life of Job, he had, he had everything going great. He was blessed tremendously and it was all taken away and gone in a matter of a day. We know that that can happen to us. But whether... We have those, those great blessings or not. Lord, help us to just have the proper attitude and be content with the things that we have and not to have the wrong attitude, not to look on others or be envious of other people for the blessings they receive, but rather to be joyful about it and to rejoice when someone else is blessed. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the wisdom that you've given us tonight through your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.